Okay, it's nice to be here. I've met a lot of interesting people and learned about a lot of interesting projects going on. <clears throat> I've been interested in the uh, techniques that can make machines learn since I was an undergraduate. I recently, there's been a lot of applications in machine learning techniques, both to internet services and to applications. Things like Google search wouldn't happen without learning. <clears throat> Things like uh, spam detection, face recognition, online recommendation systems that recommend books or, or dates and other things. Uh, and other things like intrusion detection system and antivirus. These all depend on learning. <clears throat> and although the learning gives them a lot of capability, they also introduce some vulnerabilities in those systems. And often they're very easy to spoof. Just like a, a, con artist, a con artist can fool people, in many cases these new types of learning systems are easy to spoof with techniques that you would look at and say, well, that's not possible to, to fool the system with such an easy, easy approach. And so what this talk is about is to raise kind of awareness that when you use learning techniques and systems that are publicly available, they often can be attacked. So another name for this talk might be how to build learning systems that don't act as if they were born yesterday. I'm going to give you a very high-level overview of some of the problems, some of the kinds of attacks, how to, how to give a taxonomy of attacks, and what kinds of defenses are available to protect, to protect against these kinds of attacks. So I'm going to focus on, on machine learning used for security applications. And machine learning is used for a number of reasons. The first one is that it can process lots of data and automate the decisions that are required by looking across that data. Second one, it can adapt quickly to changes. And on the internet, things are changing all the time. So this is an important feature. And the third one is it can be customized to each individual. And for things like uh, preferences, uh, recommendation systems, they need to be you know, customized to each, each individual's preferences. Some examples of machine learning systems that are used for security include things like uh, spam detection uh, in the upper left, uh, intrusion detection. Uh, Google has a whole suite of, of folks working on protecting themselves against people who try to manipulate their scores so that, they, so that if you enter a certain word, it, point, it points to a, a page that they own or that they would like you to, to point to. One of the most famous uh, Google bombing techniques was people who manipulate the phrases so they point to a particular location. So for example, there was, for political reasons, there are some people who manipulated websites. So when you, you entered the words failure, they point to George Bush's biography. <coughs> Google be, became aware of that. That doesn't happen anymore. But there's still people who are trying to manip manipulate uh, Google scores. In fact, there are companies who, go, who, who are paid to try to do that kind of manipulation. Uh, there's also uh, credit card fraud systems, which are trained online and are currently extremely effective. Uh, there's antivirus systems and uh, face recognition systems. All of these require training data uh, and learning systems to get good performance. So what I want to do is go through some of the concepts of, ma of machine learning, talk about what makes this problem a reasonable problem, talk about how you, you wind up into an arms race between defenders and attackers over time, Talk about ways to characterize attacks and defenses and give some examples of over the last few years of this, these, these arms races. <clears throat> so a machine learning system has a couple of basic components. The first one is that there's a set of training data, and that training data has labels. So for example, for a face recognition system, the training data might be an image of somebody's face, which might be downsampled to get a smaller number of features. Each image will have associated with it the name of that person. Those will be provided to a learning system. It'll take this feature of input vectors and come up with a, a, a label. So this might be a person's name, and person's A or, or person B. And during training, I'll build a system up that can reliably do this classification. Then when I use the system, <coughs> I'll present, say, a face, which will, will present a set of features. And the classifier's job is to determine who that, who that face belongs to and to label that. So that's a basic system. <coughs> If there's an adversary shown by this, this black this black hatted person over here, that person could come in and if if he's possible, he could change the labels and features during training. And that would be a very capable adversary to do that. Or what as a system is being used online, they could go in and change the features to try to force a different classification. Uh, the defender is trying to keep this this adversary from from uh, changing the system inappropriately. The adversary, in addition to, to uh, changing input labels and features, they also might be able to see what the output of the classifier is. And given that and some knowledge of the classifier, that makes them even more capable to try to manipulate this classifier to do what they would like to do. <coughs> For example, in antivirus systems, the adversary could go out and he could buy the antivirus tool, put it on his computer, and make sure that his attack can get through that antivirus system 
And that would be a more capable adversary who could see the outputs. So the, so the uh, interaction that you wind up getting is there will be an adversary who will have an attack against the system that might be successful at the beginning. The defender sees that, sees that attack, comes up with a defense against that. The attacker notices that his attack, his, his attack is not effective anymore, creates a new attack, and you wind up getting this cycle, this, this arms race, where you build up and up and up and, be, and become more complicated, complicated as you go over time. <coughs> Okay, so this, this whole approach doesn't make any sense unless the adversary is limited in what they can do. Right, so if you, have an, if you have an adversary, so look, think of a problem where there are two inputs, uh, I'm calling x1 and x2, <coughs> uh, and it can take on two values, and we want a classifier such that if any one of the values is high, it's this one class in this, this red area. If it's low, then it's another class in, in this blue area, say labeled B. Well, if the classifier, if the attacker can just take all the training data and flip the examples uh, opposite to what they were, then you can make you can get 100% errors, and there's nothing you can do about it. And so this only makes sense if the classifier, if the attacker is limited in what they can do. And so some of the examples of limitations in what the attacker is is, is able to do to the system would be like in in, uh, in spam, <coughs> the email message that that an attacker creates has to be valid HTML, has to be interpreted by your browser correctly, and present a message that when you look at it, you can understand that message. That puts a lot of re restrictions on what the attacker can do. Uh, in internet uh, intrusion detection, the packets that are sent for the attacker have to execute on the computer and exploit a, a vulnerability, and then sometimes violate a security policy on that computer. That puts a lot of restrictions on what that, what that packet can contain and what it looks like as it goes over the network. <coughs> in Google bombing, the, uh, the links that are created to try to manipulate the Google search engine you know, have to exist on valid websites, point to websites, they take up a limited fraction of the internet, and, and have a strong effect on the, on the page rank. Those constraints make these problem, make it feasible to try to protect against these attacks uh, and, 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 and mount an effective defense. So let me talk about how these kinds of arm races evolve over time. Let me talk about an example from biology as an example of a, simil a simple one-dimensional arms race. There's a, uh, an animal called a rough-skinned newt it's a, in, uh, in Western California. <laughs> this newt is preyed upon by garter snakes. And over time, over evolutionary time, the newt has learned to sequester a poison in its skin. This is the same poison that's used in, the, that's in uh, blowfish. It's also in the South American poison dart, dart frog. <laughs> uh, that poison... Uh, can 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 if 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 you took a garter snake from the east coast and you move it to the west coast and you fed it one of these newts it would die, but in this area the, the garter snake has evolved a resistance to this poison, and if you go to different parts of California, the the, the newts have different amounts of poison in their skin and the garter snakes have different resilience to that poison. The end result of this is that the the garter snake is doing a better job at getting resistant to the poison than the newt is at getting enough poison into its, into its skin. There's enough poison now in, the, in these newts that if you ate the newt, you would die. There's enough poison for about 20, to kill about 20 people, and people have died eating these newts. So this is a one-dimensional arm, arms race <coughs> where the newt is, is, is creating poison and the garter snake is getting resilience to that. It's a very simple, this is a very simple arms race. If you look in the field of intrusion detection, <clears throat> uh, if you look in the field of intrusion detection, things are much more complicated because the attacker has such a, such a wide choice. So this shows the number of vulnerabilities in a database that's kept by the government over the year. These are, these are vulnerabilities in software they might be using on your PC. And you can see there's, all, there's more than 5,000 vulnerabilities. Each one of these is a choice that an attacker can choose from to break into your system. <clears throat> there's a type of vulnerability called buffer overflow meaning that the attacker writes into a buffer and writes across the buffer. And although that sounds innocuous, it lets the attacker run arbitrary code on your computer. And these have existed for many years. Uh, there's attacks, spear phishing attacks would be an attack targeted to you as an individual. Somebody, an attacker would, would uh, try to see what you do, who you write email to, maybe even steal an email from somebody else and make it malicious so that when you open it, it would compromise your system. Uh, SQL injection is an attack against database servers. So instead of sending a query to a database over the network, 
you send a specially crafted query that lets the attacker execute code on that, on that system if it's not filtered out. Uh, a zero-day attack is an attack that, uh, against a vulnerability that nobody has seen before. So if anybody knows about the recent Stuxnet attack against the Iranian uranium processing plants, that attack had four zero-day uh, exploits in, in it. It's an unprecedented number and an unprecedented sophistication of an attack against the system. Uh, there are client-side attacks. These are attacks that client-side means that if you have a client, that client is a browser, that browser goes to a website, and the simple act of going to that website and looking at an image can, can compromise your system. Uh, there's also uh, other, uh, many other kinds of attacks, including social engineering attacks where you're fooled into doing something. So when you're looking at a, uh, <coughs> uh, this arms race from a, a computer defense perspective, there are lots of dimensions to this, and there's no easy way to predict which way the attacker is going to go uh, to, to create their next attack. <clears throat> so what, is a, what does an adversary do during this kind of asymmetric arms race? So here's an example of what, happened, what has happened with spam. You know, how attackers who are sending spam messages to try to get past the spam filters and get things to you to read have happened. So initially, spam messages were just a simple text message, and this is, <laughs> this is before the ARPANET had images. It was just, it was just text at one point. <clears throat> After that, images were added, <clears throat> and the images would, would send a message. Those images were then, then detected, uh, and the messages were, were, were made a little more complicated. So there's images, there's text, but there's also all these words. And these words, as it's called a good word attack, these words are designed such that a simple classifier, an A-based classifier, would get a high enough score by seeing these good words uh, that would lower the effect of these bad words that could be detected with an optical character recognition system. And so you look at this and say, who in the world would respond to this kind of message? But enough people did to, to make this successful. <clears throat> Following that, the, the people who were doing spam detection did optical character recognition. And so they would, they would try to recognize these words. So the spammers uh, made the images really complicated so the optical character recognizers wouldn't work anymore. And so people could read that, but the OCRs couldn't read that. And they still have the, 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 these good words again. <clears throat> and again, you say people responded to these things. <clears throat> and then the, 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 OC, the OCR systems got much better. They could deal with this, this, these ju jumbled optical uh, text. <clears throat> and so spammers started doing very focused uh, spam messages to a particular set of people. And this is a spam message that was sent to the CEOs of, of, a, of a couple hundred large companies. And if you can read it, it's, 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 a, it's a subpoena. Uh, looks like it came from the US District Court. It looks like a very official document. And if, you, if they responded to this, your system would be compromised, and the, and the attacker could spread through your system. And something like 5% of the CEOs responded to this, even though it came from the email, and, and the US District Court doesn't send things out like this over email, but it looked very good and very official. And the, th the people will tell you, look, look for misspellings and things like that, and ungrammatical stuff. This isn't misspelled. It isn't ungrammatical. It looks like a beautiful document. <clears throat> and then what spammers have done more recently <clears throat> is expand out to, to lots of different domains. So instead of just email, uh, there's now spam, there's SMS spam. There's, there's blog, if, many of the blogs are just overwhelmed with spam. Uh, there's, there's, uh, if you look at the YouTube comments, those can get filled up with spam. Uh, Facebook, and, you know, is, they're just expanded out. And each one of these services has to protect themselves against this kind of spam. <clears throat> so what does a, a defender do for this, to protect themselves against these kinds of attacks? So initially, they might have simple features. Uh, this might be an OCR system. Uh, then they get extended over time. <clears throat> uh, and so the classifier gets richer, more complicated. In addition, the classifier adapts over time to, to keep track of maybe the normal background traffic uh, imagery that you might, might want to see, as, as well as adapting to these new attacks. <clears throat> so the end state for, the, for these, these, uh, uh, <clears throat> these arms races can be different. So for, for intrusion detection system, there's only going to be an and the end state would be that you have an intrusion detection system that accurately predicts what's happening on a target victim machine. And it can, it can determine the difference between normal operation and abnormal operation. So that's why many of the intrusion detection systems are moving to the endpoint client. And there are things like uh, intrusion prevention systems and personal firewalls 
systems that are running on virtual machines. Uh, you just can't do a good job of predicting uh, what's happening on an endpoint machine by a machine located at a gateway. Uh, the endpoint for spam would be that the classifiers actually look at the email, interpret it, the bit pattern as a human would, and, and decide whether or not this is something that is normal for that person or is, or is really some kind of spam message. <coughs> Right, so I'm going to look at a taxonomy of attacks. So this is the how can an how can an attacker influence a particular system? What are the dimensions that you can look at? This is this is an extension of some work by Barino in 2010. So one one issue is is the attacker modifying the, the system as it's used, or are they modifying the inputs going into the system, you know, or can they get at the training data? And I talked about before, it's much more effective if they, if they can get at the training data. Second dimension is how much do they know about the system? So do they have very limited knowledge about what kind of classifier is being used? You know, or do they have more knowledge? Do they know, do they know about the training data? And do they know about the, what the, the, do they have access to the complete trained system? And that's the worst case, that the attacker knows everything you're doing and can test your system and, and, and basically reverse engineer it. It's very hard to protect against that. Another part of the taxonomy is what's the attacker trying to do? So if you think about a system where there's an internet, uh, this, this is an intrusion detection system. The classifier is located distant from the endpoint. Uh, they'd like to determine what, if it's good traffic, they'd like to say, sure, this is normal traffic, that's OK. If it's bad traffic, you'd like to say this is, this is bad traffic. And so if you think about a confusion matrix, there's normal traffic and attack traffic. You'd like to say the, the right thing you'd like to say is for normal, that's, that's good. And if it's not, an, if it's an attack, you'd like to say that's an attack. But you can make two kinds of mistakes. So the attacker might. One of the goals of the attacker would be to cause false alarms. And so if this intrusion detection system, for example, kept saying it's an attack for normal traffic, you'd stop listening to it, and you, you, you wouldn't trust it anymore. That's, so that's one goal. <clears throat> the other goal would be to to have a an attack come through and not be detected, to kind of to to sneak through. So I'm gonna call that one. Uh, a deception, and I'll call this kind of attack a, a denial of service attack. <clears throat> Finally, the last part of the dimension is how specific the attack is. And so you can have an attack that was just indiscriminate and tried to get to every system, or you can have a very specific attack to try to get a particular type of, of uh, input through the system and, and not be detected. So we have those four parts of the taxonomy, uh, and I'll, I'll talk about examples of this next. But let me first talk about the kinds of defenses you can mount against those kinds of attacks. <clears throat> there's five basic ways to protect against these, these kinds of attacks. Uh, there's there's uh, detecting attacks in their sources, denying access, verifying decisions, making a classifier robust, and adaptation. Let me go through each one of these. <clears throat> so one of the most effective one is detecting attacks in their sources. <clears throat> and security companies put a lot of effort and to finding out where the attacks are coming from. And they have systems called honeypots and honey nets. And these are systems that are set up around the world across different dimensions. So there's, there's, there are mail honeypots, there are website honeypots, there are websites, there are honeypots that represent uh, clients going out and, spin and searching the network looking for malicious uh, websites. <laughs> and these are continuously open and continuously being used to find where attackers are coming from and build what they call blacklist, or lists of IP addresses and domains uh, that you want to block from your network because you know that those sites have attackers on them. And if any, anyone is using Google, Google has clients that are searching, continuously searching the network, and they'll block you from going to a website that's malicious. They'll put up a warning so you don't go to that website. Uh, that's part of this, is this analysis about uh, finding where the attackers are coming from. Now, the limitation of this is the attackers can move real quickly, so this, date, this data can be quickly out of date but it's effective for things that are there for a while. <clears throat> Another thing that, that uh, security companies are doing are getting, getting samples of malware, understanding what that malware is doing, and then automatically creating signatures to find that malware, to see, see the results of that malware, and block the traffic that's generated from that malware. This is a particular project uh, called Botnet Judo, where they capture uh, malware, they run it, and they try to understand how it's generating uh, uh, text that's put in spam messages, like this, these best practices channel, uh, they're you know, selling things, and they point people to websites. Once they, can de once they know what it's producing, they can then search for that and block traffic with that content. 
The other, uh, there's also a lot of work trying to find out where, where attacks are coming from. This is some work, uh, some, some, some displays generated in our lab. Uh, the left-hand side shows the parts of places around the world where there's excessive malicious, malicious activity relative to the number of machines in, per city. <clears throat> and you can see that the, most, the, the greatest concentration of malicious activity is in Eastern Europe. And there are quite a few IP address, I, you know, I, quite a few internet providers in Eastern Europe, where known malicious activity occurs, but the, uh, the there's no action to get rid of to, to get rid of it. It's sort of allowed implicitly. <clears throat> the right hand side shows places around the world where there's much less malicious activity than you'd expect by the population, and you can see that the two places with with less activity than you'd expect are South Korea and and in Japan. And that's partly because in South Korea, they have a national ID system. You can't log in and post comments on, on large websites without using your national ID. And in Japan, there's a lot of cooperation between the government and ISP providers to get rid of uh, infected systems as quick as they see them. And so these kinds of maps <clears throat> are used to, to create blacklists, again, to prevent traffic from those systems to get into your sites and, and prevent the attacker from even get, getting to you. <clears throat> the second way of prevention <coughs> is, to not, is to deny attacker access to parts of the data. So one way to keep an attacker from getting access to your training data is to not let them know where your training data is coming from. And so there are existing systems that are anomaly detection systems that have to correct, co co collect data across time to build models of what that traffic looks like. And so what they do is they capture traffic from geographically diverse locations, located in many different sites. They collect that data at, at different times, and they collect it on different servers at different locations. So that, that sampling technique is extremely hard for an attacker to mimic, and so they really won't know what data you're basing your model on, uh, and it, it'll be hard for them to, to, to mimic that and to defeat it. <clears throat> another, another technique that's used is to make the classifier you use in your, in your, in your system complicated. So maybe make it a, a classifier made of many smaller classifiers, and don't let people know what, what the, um, how features are selected and how the classifier is trained. <clears throat> and don't let the adversary get the training data. In many cases, the, the output of the classifier also may be somewhat randomized, so it so it's, can't be easily predicted. So for example, if you had an antivirus system, maybe sometimes you want to have an output that's unpredictable based on the input, so, the, so it's hard for the attacker to do a re reverse engineering on that. Uh, and this notion about lying about, about the randomizing or, and, and lying about the output sometimes can be effective in protecting. So the, the next one <coughs> is to, to make sure when you're building a classifier that that classifier gets, gets correct ground truth and is as close to the ground truth as possible. So if you're doing an, an intrusion detection system and you have a classifier that's far away from the, from the endpoint, uh, sometimes it is the, that's not a good thing to do. You're better to know, you, you should know exactly what's happening as close as possible to the, to the victim. <clears throat> and so in, in terms of, again, making, making ground truth correct, you'd like to use, if possible, you'd like to use multiple sources to identify who the attacker is, You'd like to accurately determine the effect of the of the attack with multiple multiple dimensions, uh, and then the fourth technique is to use robust classification. So this is a picture from a spam detection system created by Barracuda Networks, and if you could read all these stages, each one of these stages is a different approach to try to detect spam. The spam has been a really tough problem, and the only way it's been almost solved. Is to, is to have many different approaches to try to spot spam and eliminate it. So for example, this system uh, has blacklists of known spammers, so it has its own set of honey nets that are out there collecting spam. So they have their own set of thousands of email addresses uh, that shouldn't be getting any emails. They monitor that to find, to find out what the spam is. And they have a thing called reputation-based servers, reputation-based analysis to analyze where that spam is coming from, where they'll, they'll block it from people with bad reputations. Uh, there's some internet protocols to validate the sender. Uh, they, they'll look at images and process those. So there's, if there's a known image that's being sent out, like the image I showed you before, they'll block that. Uh, they'll do OCR on the images. Uh, they'll try to mitigate these, these images I showed you that were obfuscated. 
uh, they'll do automated analysis, and then they'll do some statistical classification based on the content of the message to see if that content looks more like normal mail or, or like a uh, spam mail. And it's, it's only when all of these things are put together that you get a, a decent performance. <clears throat> Another issue about robust classifiers uh, is to build a classifier that isn't affected by a few outlier patterns. So this is a simple classifier. This is one class in the bottom, two, two dimensions, one, another red class on the top. <clears throat> this is a support vector machine classifier. And for this particular classifier, there's enough, <clears throat> it's flexible enough so that if only five bad patterns are put in, that pokes a hole in this decision region, uh, in this upper region, that could allow a very specific attack to punch through that region and be accepted uh, in, terms of, in, in terms of an attack that you, that you get, get through. So it's important to, to match the, the complexity of the classifier to the, only the complexity required by the problem, and don't make it so flexible that it's easy for an attacker to manip manipulate it and get by. <laughs> Another example of that is that the classifier has to be designed to be robust to changes in the input that, that an attacker might do, but there would still be an effective attack. So if you look at this, you can see this says create a prosperous future for yourself. If you have a classifier that's doing extract, exact string matches looking for that phrase, it wouldn't, this would get by. <coughs> so the classifier has to be more robust and look at inexact string matching to, to uh, detect these kinds of things. And you saw a lot of these a few years ago. These, these have gone away because the classifiers have become much more robust to detect this kind of thing. <coughs> Another issue is to, is to learn sort of the core features related to the attack. And uh, there's been a lot of work on building classifiers that are robust to feature deletion, where you pull, pull a few features out and still have an effective attack. But it, the classifier may not see it. <coughs> OK, so the final one is to make a class, is to adapt the classifier as, atta as attacker techniques change. Uh, this is some data from uh, spam analysis. And each one of these curves, this is time, this dimension, this is the percentage of spam messages that have this characteristic. And these were uh, techniques that would insert like uh, text that a user couldn't see that because it was so small, uh, or HTML comments that were that were uh, that would keep the intrusion detection, keep the uh, spam filter from detecting a particular word. And you can see that these these techniques were used over a, over a period of months, then became ineffective over time. And there are other techniques that the attackers started using after that. And so the the uh, a system that worked well here or work well here would not work, work, work well going on here. And the attackers are, start, start, are, not, are were using these techniques. They were effective. They stopped using those techniques, and they started using other techniques. And this is part of this adaptation. Uh, a technique that the attackers always wind up using is this is the number of emails that have an embedded uh, link to a web page in them. And this has stayed high over time, because the attackers need to do this to make their, their attack effective. If you can't click on a link, then they're not going to get you to go to their website. And so there are some characteristics like this of attacks that are going to be there and you're going to rely on. There are other attacks, other characteristics that, are ch that change over time and you need to adapt to. All right, so let me show some examples <coughs> of uh, attacks and defenses. This is some theoretical work uh, from the area of pack learning. <coughs> and they say that if you have some training data and I allow the attacker access to that training data, what kind of damage can the attacker do? And so if you randomly select patterns from the training data, a, a fraction eta of patterns from the training data, then the error rate is going to be a, around eta, if, if eta is a small number. Uh, if you allow the, if instead you allow the attacker to look over all the patterns and select the, the most damaging ones, uh, then the error can be uh, greater than twice, two, twice the fraction of the patterns that you let the attacker get at. So if the attacker can vary even a small fraction, 10% of the training data, he can make your error rate greater than 2%. And a 2% deception error rate is enormous for something like spam. And, uh, and so these are, these are kind of machine learning theoretical results. Uh, and the way, to, the way to prevent that is to keep the attacker from getting access to the training data, which seems pretty obvious. Uh, another attack is called what's called a red herring spurious feature attack. Uh, this is for intrusion detection system. And the notion was you have to send, you're, you're, you're targeting a system by sending packets at it. And there's a set of packets, T1, T2, and T3, that are required to make that attack successful. And the, atta and the attacker knows that, but the attacker also knows that how the, how the classifier works. And so they add 
in addition to these packets, every time they send these packets, they send these spurious features. And they might be like 100, more than two, but it might be 100 spurious features. And so when the, when the learning system is trained, it learns that you need to, when I see T1, T2, T3, and these spurious features, that that's an attack, I'll detect that, and I'll say this is a bad thing. And so the, the attacker knows that, and so instead of sending all of these, they'll send T1, T2, T3, and then leave off the last one, the less spurious attack. That'll be effective, it'll get through the system. Eventually the defender will learn that this is a bad thing, and then the attacker will say, well, now I'll just leave off the next spurious feature, and that'll get to. So if you started out with 100 spurious features, you've got a pretty long lifetime to keep chopping that away until you get down to the core feature. And, and that can be prevented by an attack, by a, a learning system that's, ro that's robust uh, and knows and can find the smallest set of features that's required for this attack. And you can do that with some, some reverse analysis. <coughs> So another, another sort of common type of attack, <coughs> it's called a blending attack. <coughs> the way this works is say you're, you're uh, on network A and the attacker is on this, this network and you want to attack network B. Well, the attacker can look at all, the, all of the normal traffic that's going from network A to network B. And if they know that the intrusion detection system is looking at statistics of the content of those packets, so say for example they're looking at a histogram of the, uh, within, a, within a, a connection of the byte values within that packet. So that's some distribution. They can tailor the attack so it has the same distribution by, by changing the uh, encryption key that's used by the, in, in the attacker and changing the way the, the uh, actual exploit is, is written. And this turns out to be pretty easy to do. And so once you've done that, when you can run the attack by, it'll have the same so one gram statistics and it'll, it'll be accepted by the system and it won't be detected. Uh, and this is, a, this, is a, this is a common approach to try to make the attack traffic look like the background traffic to get by. And this is also used in, uh, in, in things like anomaly detection. If the attacker knows that you're training an anomaly detection system, they can slowly vary the, the real content to look more and more and more like the attack and then get through in the end with, with that system. And so the protections against this are to deny the attacker access to the training data so they don't know what the, what the normal traffic is like and to use a more robust classifier. And so the solution for this particular uh, intrusion detection system was to go to higher order uh, sequences, to look at sequences of two or three packets, and also to randomly uh, look at, look at uh, sequences where you look at one packet and the packet offset by n, where the attacker didn't know what that n is and couldn't predict that. <coughs> I already, already talked about these good word attacks uh, where they add these words at the end of a message that will statistically make this, uh, this, this, this email look more like normal email. And the defenses of those are to know that this is the kind of attack that happens uh, and use a classifier that's robust that can see these, these extra words and know that this, this is not a normal thing. This, this isn't something that's, that you see in, in normal emails. <coughs> There's a very nice paper on uh, insertion innovation attacks by Tachek and Newsom. Uh, and this focuses on the fact that you have intrusion detection systems and they're often at the, at the sort of the end point or the periphery of a network. If somebody wants to buy one device, stick it on a, on, a, on a firewall or a router at the end and protect thousands of people behind that firewall. <laughs> and the problem is that that device is way out here and it's trying to predict what happens when a packet goes through this complicated network comes out and then hits this system, and who knows what this system is and how it works. In order for this to work, the, this, this system has to predict the effect of the, all of the routes going on the network, and also has to predict accurately how that final system is built, what its stack does, how it, re, how it reconstructs packets, what it does in some unusual case when it sees a protocol messages it hadn't seen before. And that's a really difficult thing to do. And so one of the examples they had where you send a set of packets out of order, so one means it should be the first one, two is the second one, three is the third one, et cetera. The, the classifier out here doesn't know how this system is going to reconstruct those packets, or it's too simple and it doesn't really implement that full reconstruction. So it sees this, this garbly stuff and doesn't see it as an attack. It gets to the victim, the victim reconstructs it in the right way, it's an effective attack and gets through, 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 to, the, through to the system and compromises it. And this is the, there are lots of other ways to do this. There's manipulation of time to live, uh, and there are other techniques within the protocol such that when you look here, 
it won't look right, but when you get here, it gets reconstructed and actually compromises the system. And this is a general problem. <clears throat> and the only approach to solving that is to, is to make sure that, the, that you know when the system is being compromised and when it's not being compromised, and make sure that you're reconstructing what would happen on the target victim out here at the classifier and doing it accurately. And there's been a whole raft of papers trying to solve this problem uh, in simple ways. And the, uh, the, the correct solution that people are doing is, like I said, is putting the intrusion detection system on the endpoints and the victim machines. <coughs> Another kind of clever attack is there's a system called a snort intrusion detection system. This is its, its, its logo. <coughs> that intrusion detection system has a set of signatures for different attacks. So there's hundreds of signatures in it. Each signature represents a byte sequence that expects to see from an attack. Well, this, this attacker can say, let me look at all these byte sequences. For each byte sequence, I'll construct a packer, a, a single packet uh, that will cause that intrusion detection system to fire because that packet is exactly what it, it, it's expected to see. And so you launch, so they've created a tool that tool launches thousands of packets on the network. The intrusion detection system goes off like crazy because it sees all these packets flying by. Uh, the packets actually don't do any harm because they're, they're not a complete connection to a victim machine. But the intrusion detection system is simple enough, it just fires because of that. So this causes a tremendous denial of service. And if this happens to anybody, they would generally turn off the system and ignore it. So you could, you could put, or put up a smoke screen this way and get, a, get an attack sneak underneath. I'm sneaking underneath this. This is prevented by making the intrusion detection system much more complicated so that it only would detect the signature when it saw a complete connection to the endpoint machine uh, and a response back from that machine to show that it was processing those bytes. <clears throat> but it was a very clever tool. All right, so that's an overview. So summary is that uh, this taking a learning system and putting it out in the public where it can be manipulated often creates this kind of long-term adversarial arms race where the attacker keeps generating and modifying a system and coming, becoming more and more complicated attacks. And the defender has to keep up with that. And you need to realize that this is going to happen. It's going to be part of what's going on. You should be looking for this to happen. And you should be trying to defend against it. And you, need to, you can survive or be eaten. So to, to survive, you need to proactively understand what an attacker can do. Look at the taxonomy. Look at the kinds of defenses that are available. <clears throat> and use those to understand the attacks and what are, what are effective defenses for your system. <clears throat> and monitor these over time to try to maintain performance and, and keep good operation and good performance as, as you go along. But, but sort of go into this with your, with your uh, eyes open to understand that this is going to happen. Think about attacks and think about defenses. OK, thank you. So just as some of this is a, a workshop we ran at NIPS in 2007. There's a special issue of the Journal of Machine Learning on this. And I have references. And there's a whole set of references to some of the papers and the concepts that I've talked about. Okay. Yep. Uh, yep. So the question was, is there, da is there data on the cost to the attackers and defenders in the spam arms race? There's a, there are some detailed analyses of how much it costs the attacker, the, the attackers to generate spam and how much money they make that's been uh, obtained by taking over some of the spam servers uh, and where the, where the money is, is, is sequestered. And so that's economic. Uh, and I could point you to some of those. There's also some detailed economic numbers about uh, people who do, uh, who own botnets and how they make money and uh, how they distribute, how they take a large botnet and break it up, give it to different people, and what it costs to, to purchase those bots. It's usually, it's usually pretty inexpensive to buy a new exploit because there are people who sell exploits for like hundreds of dollars. And the, the, the real expense, I think, comes in, in management. Uh, and, and sales. Along the same lines, do we have a notion of how much of any cold computer based on the internet is 
only working either towards creating STEM and distributing it or doing malicious stuff, and how much of it is there to protect the normal user? So there's a continuous debate about how many systems are infected right. <coughs> over time. But there are known statistics on, bot on, uh, on networks of, inf of systems that have been affected on botnets. And there are known botnets that are of sizes of 1,000 to 10,000 uh, of systems that are being that are controlled and used by others. And there are statistics, uh, Symantec and other security companies publish statistics on how many systems have been compromised uh, every six months. So that, and those are rough numbers, because those are systems that are compromised by known exploits uh, and are found by, by, and that they found with their tools. There are lots of systems that they don't find, so you don't know about that. <clears throat> there was a, there was a time when it was an ISP that was a source of lots of spam went offline, and spam dropped. But then the people who were on that ISP moved over to another ISP, and it came back up in a very short amount of time. So Is that, really just that one. that's that's the only example I've heard about? But I haven't heard about a general lull in spam. <laughs> yeah, yes. That's what I saw on headlines. It was over this past holiday. Yeah, I haven't I haven't seen that. So the question is, are, are spammers <laughs> mainly trying to get you to send money, or are there other goals? There are other sometimes political goals that, that spammers will do, but uh, most, of the, most of the spam is trying to get money. So they'll have a phone number, or they'll have a link to click on. Uh, some of the spam is trying to get people to buy stocks. You know, so, so there's a, a class of spam, uh, it was called penny, penny, Scott, penny stock scam, where they'd say, buy this stock. And surprisingly, people would get these garbled spams, and they'd buy the stock. And the spammer would buy this ahead of time. It would go up. They'd sell it right away and make some money on it. So there are other things like that where it's not money, but it's it's convincing people to buy things. Yep. That that was trying to fool the CEOs into into clicking on the. It was a PDF file that was attached, and so as soon as they as soon as they clicked on that. And saw that fake subpoena, that that PDF file had malicious code in it that ran, compromised their system, and took over their network. So the whole goal of that was was to get them to click on this this, this PDF file. They didn't actually see that. They saw a message coming from the, the Department of State. They click on it and then see this image, and it looked like a realistic thing. So the goal was just to get them to click on the image. Actually, I guess I guess they saw the image, and if they clicked on it, that action would 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 uh, load malicious code and compromise their system. Yep. Since only the beginning, right? Yep. You can still there are certain there are certain kinds of attacks that are, that are protected by a gateway, so that's a good thing. So for the for scans and denial of service attacks, gateways protect against those. But for for targeted attacks, uh, you really need to have protection at the endpoints. <coughs> and many sites are moving to that. So mo many sites have uh, <coughs> endpoint intrusion detection systems or personal firewalls for for protection. Yep. People, people are hiring people to spam. Okay. And so there, there are, are known folks who you go to, actually. What people will do is that somebody who's good at writing exploits will write an exploit, <clears throat> they'll compromise thousands of computers, and they'll keep them as a group. And then they'll hire, and if you say, send, you'll say, send spam out, they use those thousands of computers to send the spam out. So it's hard to block, because it's being sent out by all these computers. So your computer at home may be compromised by a spammer. If you leave it on all the time, you, you, know, you may be still writing your Word document on it, but inadvertently it's sending out thousands of spam messages. Uh, 
<laughs> I'm, I, I have a white hat on and a black hat on. <laughs> I'll do that. Yep. Yeah, there's a lot, there's a lot, there are a lot of people working on those kinds of solutions. Uh, it's difficult because that involves a new protocol. Uh, and so there's a, there have been a lot of uh, proposals to modify uh, the mail protocol to try to get rid of spam. And a lot of them have been accepted. Uh, but it's a hard problem to add that security to the, to the existing infrastructure and make it work. But that's a, that's a good solution. Lots of people have proposed that. Uh, and it would be a, it'd be a, a a good approach for lots of spam. Yep. Yep, so that's a good question. How, how good are intrusion detection systems at finding new attacks that haven't been seen before? The, the bulk of the systems uh, focus on uh, finding attacks that have been seen, but they're quite a, but people realize that's a problem, and, that, and that's going to work well. So there's a real focus on systems that, that analyze the system to understand what's normal, and they look for abnormal behavior. And so there's kind of behavior-based systems. And that's a real focus of current research. Uh, and there are some antivirus tools that still already do that. Uh, the issue is that they're very, uh, they don't want to have a lot of false alarms. Uh, but that definitely is the, is the direction that research is going, to try to, to model good behavior. Instead of, instead of modeling all these bad things that happen, they'd like to model what's normal and then look for abnormal events. The, are there some standards for false positives and false negatives? <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think I think what you shoot for is not overwhelming whoever has to pro has to look at these, because a false positive means that somebody has to look at it. And so if you if like Dartmouth had a system you installed it and it had a thousand false positives every day, you'd throw it away. But if it had one or two a day, that might be feasible. You know, one or two a day. And also, it provided information that let you quickly see whether or not it was a false alarm or, or, or a true detection. Right. So, so rates have to be very low, especially for large sites like this. Yeah, so the question is, can, can you do attribution, uh, find out who the originator of the attack is? <clears throat> and that's really, really hard. Because the attacker will, will go out and compromise a bunch of systems. There'll be, there may be a chain of three or four command and control computers between what the attacker does and where the attacker is. So it's, it's really hard to attribute an attack. So for example, the Stuxnet attack, which has been, which has been analyzed in great detail. No one knows where that came from. Uh, and there, there was a set of attacks. Uh, there are a number of attacks that have been analyzed in great detail. People still don't know who the originator of that attack code is. Yeah, there are hints, but there's no way of knowing because it just, there's such a, a long chain of events between the final attack and the person who created it. And it's so easy to hide, to obfuscate where it came from. And that's, that's, a, a, that's an issue that lots of people are working on.
That that helped, but the spammers the spammers have worked uh, worked around that, and it really hasn't been effective. Lots of things have helped, but not really gotten rid of spam. Yep. Yeah, so, so in the public domain, Microsoft is uh, actively finds who's sending spam out and sues folks who are, who are sponsoring it. So if they can find a company that is, is hiring out spam services, they'll, they'll uh, go through the courts and turn that company off. And there are a number of other companies that do that also. Because this is happening in the open, and the money has to go somewhere. And so there's a money trail to find out who, who's doing this. And that, that's been a little somewhat successful, but there's also a big underground economy that Microsoft can't go after in the courts, and that's very hard to stop. Yeah, that, that, that same cycle yeah. Over yep, there? yep. That's a similar arms race. The government started out with very simple uh, uh, filters based on words, uh, and that was, and people got around that. And now they're getting more and more uh, effective at blocking that kind of mail, that, ki that kind of uh, content. And so that, so there, the Great Firewall of China is getting more and more and more complicated over time. I, I have a question that relates to that as well. Do we know what proportion of malicious uh, traffic on the internet is government sponsored by various uh, entities? Uh, you, you spoke right. of uh, right. the, in Eastern Europe. We know that Russia has a, um, orchestrated an attack against some Baltic countries, for example. Do we know how much of that goes on, whether it's uh, very visible or not? Uh, no, we don't, because it, it's so easy to hide. So it's very hard to know where they came from. Even the attack against Estonia. There are lots of people that argue that was just Russians, Russian citizens being patriotic. Uh -huh. and so it's, it's not clear that that was true or not. <laughs> but it's hard, it's hard to know. So if you see a 1,000 machines in Russia sending packets to Estonia, were, were those the individuals who did it, or was that a coordinated attack against, you know, by the government? It's hard to, to get through who the, what the intent was and who originated it. It's, it's, just, uh, it's, it's part of a, so cyber war is a really difficult thing to strike back because you don't know where it came from for, for this reason. That's a that's a good question. So as the system gets more complicated, you start you start you stop understanding it, and it, it may be become ineffective because of that. That's a, that's a good question. I'm not sure what the the Barracuda is a company. They build a system that works, and they make money. <laughs> so so I, I'm not sure. You know, they they can see we can get through it, what cannot get through it, and so they understand it at that level. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, in fact, uh, if you look at the protection <coughs> that, uh, that are in, in Cisco routers, you know, up until a few years ago, they were easily compromised. And it was like the first target you'd go for to get it. Red teams, but it teams that try to break into the networks, they'd first break into the router, because then they can get in everywhere. And the, and the protection that's included uh, in, in, uh, in routers has gotten much better over the years. They recognize that those are prime targets. Uh, routers and firewalls and security and intrusion detection systems. There was a, 
uh, I talked about the snort intrusion detection system. At one point, you could send the packet over the network and compromise the intrusion detection system because it, it had a vulnerability on it. And so, so attackers really try to target those systems, and, and they're often very vulnerable. <coughs> I think I said that the most important question for the end, what would you want to eat and use? <laughs> yeah, they were drunk. It was a dare. There were a couple guys who were drunk and they were dared. And it happened a couple times. Okay. And so they dare you to eat this too. And he wound up dying. All right. Well, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Okay. Okay.